Welcome to the show, guys. I am so excited to have you on today. Before we uh, get going into the meat of our interview today, can you tell us a little bit about the brand and your story and you guys and where you come from? Yeah, well, we're so excited um, about this. We love resilient retail, so thank you for having us. Um, I'm Jean Foley, one of the co-founders of Suit Shop. Um, I, my background um, is in apparel product development, technical design. Um, the idea for Suit Shop came from my own personal experience planning my wedding in 2013 and going through the process of getting nine guys suited up um, in poor fitting tuxedos with a price tag of $250, which just seemed so outrageous. So I partnered with my bestie, Diana, here um, to launch this company in 2016. <clears throat> yep. And I'm Diana Gans. I'm Jean's best friend since third grade. Um, <clears throat> while Jean went to fashion design school, I um, went ahead and got my MBA uh, in Boston. And so she got married, experienced this tough pain point with her wedding. I was a bridesmaid in her wedding, saw what was happening. You know, as a bridesmaid, we had such a fabulous experience getting our attire sorted and we had so many options and price points. And then the guys were sort of left with this terrible tuxedo <laughs> rental and sort of making do the day of swapping jackets. Um, and these are like young, handsome guys in their twenties yeah, uh, and thirties that really should look like a million bucks and <laughs> kind of look like, it's, you know, they've made the best of it. And Gene, your photos <laughs> look great, but I'm just saying could have been better. <laughs> I mean, I look at my photos and you can, you can just see how ill fitting they were, but it didn't ruin my day at all. And, <laughs> no, and, and, no. and Thankfully, that, that yeah, happened. It's a we yeah, started a business. Exactly. Now we get to yeah. work together <laughs> full time, selling suits, and here we are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we started in in <laughs> Queens, New York. So um, it's not you know super affordable to live in New York. We all know mm -hmm. that, and <laughs> retail space was just not an option. Um, so, and and honestly, our very first suit order was for only 200 suits. So that's, we've scaled from that. And it's pretty miraculous that we were able to build such a big business off such a small start, but we did. And, um, and we love our, our website. It continues to be the number one source of sales for us. So we're outfitting thousands wow. of guys all over the country. Um, and yeah, they don't ever have to go into a store. Super convenient. And in the, and even in like, I mean, blessing in disguise recent year, we've realized, gosh, how lucky we are that we were born like online, a mm -hmm. digitally native brand. But even in places where we have a showroom, um, we have realized that, especially with men, sometimes they just prefer to order on their couch. And that is kind of the ultimate customer experience, right? Like if you can give customers as good of an experience as they would have in at home and they don't have to leave their home. And especially nowadays mm -hmm. where it might not be safe to leave your home. Um, mm -hmm. It's really worked out well for us. Yeah. And this is where things get interesting though, because you have all this success online and you're realizing this is really how our customers want to shop. And yet you still decide mm -hmm. to enter retail, nonetheless, opening retail stores during a pandemic. Where did the decision to go into retail come from and, and how's it been? How's that journey entering retail been? Yeah, we, well, we didn't truly decide <laughs> to do retail. We, yeah. um, we rented a really cool, like lofty type space in Chicago when we relocated the business. Um, and it was mostly for warehouse, warehousing our product. So we were growing out, we grew out of our uh, little tiny apartment in New York, relocated to this, what we thought was a huge space, 2000 square feet, uh, racks and racks of suits. That's where we did all of our shipping, customer service, yoga pants like diana said that and people because we we people looked up where our address was on google and it would list this location people started showing up so oh. um we'd get knocks on this door it was a total mess people would walk in and we're like you're not supposed to be here <laughs> this is not a retail <laughs> store but they loved it and every time a customer came in and we got them fitted um they just they felt like they were having this great experience that they had found this like um special place where they got really affordable suits and um as that as traffic started to increase we were like you know what 
we we should renovate this space and make it nice and make it a great place where people can come and get fitted. And so we did um, we did just that, and it ended up being a really great way um, to just like show what great customer service we have in person and host group parties and you know have the guys have a yeah. drink while they get fitted. So it was great. Mm-hmm. That's such a funny story. Just like the the accidental stumble into retail. And it's funny because I've actually heard it now multiple times is it's this, your customers start to do this behavior where they're asking about a store. They're just showing up to your office and saying, I thought this was a store. I really want a store. And I, I find it really impressive that you guys took that signal from your customers and said, we're not going to ignore this. We're going to just kind of like undo some plans and decide, okay, if they want this, we're going to build it out. And then you guys have expanded into multiple stores. What was the, Mm -hmm. that like, aha moment in the store that said, okay, this isn't just like we've stumbled into retail and it's going well. Now we want to actually scale up retail and and this is going to be a big part of the business. How did you come to that conclusion? Yeah. Well, I mean, our customers have always, I think that's like a really important point to note is like for a rapidly growing business. I mean, if you are in the right market and you have good product market fit, customers will tell you what they want. Mm -hmm, And so they have just continued to lead us um, to, (laughs) they are, they're pushing us out of our comfort zone because if it were up to Jean and I, we would still be shipping those orders from our apartments. (laughs) But um, we've had to, uh, we've had to expand and diversify. And so, um, yeah, we, you know, the, the, opportunity we saw how well it was being received in Chicago to have a physical retail location and then we opened up um, two others recently one in literally the middle of um, pandemic one right before a couple months before (laughs) the pandemic hit Um, and they've both been incredibly successful I mean they are packed they're booked we're hiring more employees to support them Um, and the locations really kind of came out of, um, sort of circumstance for us, like the right circumstance with Mm -hmm. potential partners. So we have a great partner called hitched their wedding band, men's wedding band company. Their co-founders are in, in, um, Philadelphia. So we, we share a really nice retail space with them there. It's a nice, like complimentary fit um, between the two brands. And then I moved to Denver, um, in 2019. And so I, we've always done a ton of weddings out in Colorado. And so, and Denver, just with the way the city's growing and the demographic, it's just a really, it was an ideal opportunity. And then, you know, we're, we're thinking about right now, we've kind of put a pause on brick and mortar, but we know it's important. And we see like our sales, our online sales exponentially increase Mm -hmm. anytime we put a physical store into a new location. So we're definitely, um, yeah, we're, I mean, it's very reciprocal, like having an online store feeds that, that physical location immediately. It makes it immediately mm-hmm. profitable. You don't have to wonder like, Oh, you know, are we going to get any customers today? Like we autumn, autom- we get just people start coming in the doors, which is really nice. And then it just grows the general like online sales presence in that area as well. Yeah. With so many with so many brands being online only, I think there's something about having retail stores listed on your site, even that gives people confidence um, mm-hmm. that you're not just gonna you're not just this quick fad brand that mm. threw up a site website and is churning out you know orders through a fulfillment center. Like there's real people. There's we've invested in a location. There's product. So especially when you're dealing with special events and weddings where you're planning so far in advance. The fear for a lot of people is, will this business still be in business, you know, oh, yeah. when it comes time? What does their inventory situation look like? How how do I contact them? Like having a, a lot of brands don't have phone numbers on their site anymore. So like, like Diana said, as soon as we opened up a physical location, sales online even in that area and otherwise grew exponentially. And then every store after that, you had the effect. And it wasn't like all of the sales had to come through the store um, necessarily. It was just that like brand awareness and trust that we were a legit company and people could Mm -hmm. have had the confidence to order from us. Yeah. And it it gives customers like that 
that visceral understanding of the brand of, Mm -hmm. I see this beautiful store, even if they don't walk into it, it then creates a much bigger imprint versus just seeing like another Instagram ad because we all see so many of those. Yeah. I can't tell you how many products I've ordered off of Instagram ads. And then they're like (laughs) coming straight from China. And I'm like, I probably should have looked this up a little bit more. Like (laughs) I should have looked at the brand's website. I just was like, Oh, those baby shoes look really great. And (laughs) And then I get like a DHL delivery, like, and I'm like, huh? 30 days later. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 30 days later. Exactly. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that store strategy, because it is a, a trend that we're seeing a lot in retail where it's not that traditional, highly merchandised store. It's more of the showroom retail, <clears throat> which is a is a very exciting and interesting trend. Tell us about that strategy and what the store feels like and what its intent really is. Yeah. So I think it's really designed kind of after our own, like our own relationships that we build with customers. I mean, just it's very sort of boutique. It's very still like small company feel, even though we're becoming a much, much bigger and bigger company. We, um, we've always been close to our customers and like have had an intimate relationship with them, especially because they're going through such an important, um, because we've been more wedding based, they're going through a very important day in their life. And so we're definitely like kind of involved in the styling process and everything like that. So we wanted that same feel that we've always given customers online to really be enhanced um, in the showroom experience. And so we have, you know, various sitting areas for customers to come in and and sit down with a stylist and really kind of flush through what they want their wedding style to be. Um, We do take groups. Um, We were a little restricted with groups during like the peak of COVID and not Mm -hmm. being able to have very many people in showrooms at a time. But hopefully, you know, by the end, by the time fall comes, we'll be kind of able to get back to some of the fun that we have with groups. I mean, because this is sort of something that, again, women have had for so long where they get to go in with their girlfriends and they go try on dresses. And it's like this whole experience that men just really haven't had. So Mm -hmm. we wanted to kind of give that. in a showroom setting. And I think um, operationally, you know, the simplicity of what a showroom is, is, is so wonderful just from a, how much inventory do we have to have in there? Um, you know, making sure you have the right assortments. It's not constantly churning. So we have this like beautiful ability to, you know, have all of this product in our showroom for guys to try on and feel and touch and test different fits. But then we set up their order and ship directly to them. Uh, You know, a Mm. part of it is also like that experience of going in and getting fitted and not feeling like you don't walk out with like a big garment bag and bags of stuff that you then carry with you. Um, And when we were hosting groups um, at a time, they were often planning a night out after their fittings. Oh, yeah. And they didn't want to be walking out with a bunch, like a brand new suit or, you know, having to hold on to that the whole night. So they loved the idea of shipping direct to them, setting up their order, getting them that brand new suit and having our the try on experience in the store. So really, it, it, it's it's wonderful from like the business and operation standpoint, because we don't constantly have to be sending inventory to each showroom. But it's also from a customer perspective is like, really wonderful as well, just based on the type of brand we are. And that's when the magic happens, when you can collide those two things together of it's very beneficial Mm -hmm. and effective for our business, but it's also giving the customers the experience they actually want and is beneficial to them. Obviously, like this combines into you guys having massive growth and seeing huge percentage year over year. I think that's like a big piece of that magic is finding that that collision. The other thing as I'm I'm thinking about, you know, scaling retail or opening up another location, not having to deal with inventory in a space really mm-hmm. lowers the operational cost of that space. I'm guessing you have to hire less people. You are not mm-hmm. having to find a space that has enough area to have all that inventory yes. stocked. And so you can get a little more creative with where you find locations and how those stores feel. Yes. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I mean, our stores are like the thousand fifteen hundred square feet, and um, and initially they're only man, they're only powered by one showroom manager until yeah. 
<clears throat> you know, probably six months in and then we add an associate, but that is like ultimate resilient retail is to kind of build that way and not go like so far with your overhead that, you know, you have to be churning a certain profit to like even break even. So, and I mean, that really paid off for us in last year when everything shut down and we had at the time two locations, but they were, you know, we didn't have a lot of overhead tied up into them and we didn't have a lot of inventory sitting on the shelves. Like all of our inventory is centrally located um, at our fulfillment center. So that's, it, it, that's such a, such a large advantage that even though you couldn't have predicted it, it was like exactly what needed to be happening in the pandemic because then those stores didn't come this kind of like black box of losing money. It was still all working the same way. And you had the operations set mm-hmm. up to still ship out to to customers. And we're getting kind of in, we keep kind of touching it, but there's this gap between online and offline and starting to create kind of a bridge between the two and how customers interact in person or online. And we talked about that, like walking by the store, getting that physical trust, kind of trust battery from the brand. How else are you trying to kind of create that omni-channel, holistic commerce kind of bridge between the online and offline? Great question. I, you know, something we, the that the pandemic gave us was this moment to like really figure out how we meet the customers where they are, because, you know, the showrooms were a great strategy for us. We were excited about them, but now all of a sudden they're closed and people still want to plan their weddings, maybe even more so than they were because they have all this time now at home. And we, um, we were, you know, thinking how how do we service them the best way without the stores being there, build that trust. And so we launched virtual appointments where you basically book online um, a a day and time that works for you. And it's a great little video chat with uh, one of our stylists and people loved it. I I didn't think that they were going to take to it as quickly as they did. And I think it sort of surprised, uh, surprised us. But we then were able to use our showrooms to have these showroom managers and employees sit in the empty showroom and video chat with our customers um, all over the country. And so it really made us realize that you don't have to have that physical location. Like we love it. It's part of our, just at who we are as a brand, having these three locations, who knows if you know, we'll explore more in the future, but just having these virtual appointments gives so gives people so much trust that they, you know, are talking to a real person, that person yeah. works for the company, they have, they see the showroom behind them. Um, so that's like sort of our way of, and we kept, we kept, we continue to book virtual appointments, like back to back most days. Um, so oh. it's exciting to see that people have really, uh, like, decided that this is something that they're comfortable with, you know, chatting Mm -hmm. virtually on their lunch break about wedding suiting and getting some tips from us. Yeah. Yeah. And we've almost considered, we've like really at this point, we consider virtual appointments or virtual fittings as like our fourth showroom. Mm -hmm. You know, it's our virtual Mm -hmm. showroom. We have a Philly showroom, Chicago showroom, Denver, and then a virtual showroom. And really something that we'll be building out, I think even further as we hire more people is like, who is the manager of the, that virtual showroom uh, experience? Mm -hmm. Because um, like Jean said, I mean, they have become incredibly popular and um, continue to be booked. And I think that does help us meet, you know, while we can't be in every city, this is the way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's still just bringing that. I mean, we talk about it all the time, really the power of retail is that human interaction and that visceral, I can touch yes. these products and I can talk to a human about it and I can feel confident making a purchasing decision. And that's oftentimes I think what a lot of digitally native brands tend to lack because there's, you know, mm-hmm. you focus on the branding and the automations and the tools and the data. And then that human connection gets a little lost in all of it. And this is just such mm-hmm. a simple way where no matter how small of a brick and mortar business you have, This is a way where you can still harness that power that you have, where you know how to talk to customers in your store, still have those dialogues without having to completely upend your entire operation. Absolutely. You know, like I feel like for a little while and it's it's still happening, but the, um, 
the lack of interaction you have with a brand, a real person with a brand is so significant. You almost always either have a chat bot or all these automated processes for how you go through things. And even when you do reach out to a true customer service representative, you almost always get an auto reply with links to how to self-serve. Right. So while that's really wonderful from like a operational perspective and like just the volume thing, which we're dealing with now as we grow, we're we're having like an absolutely insane start to the year um, because people are planning again and we're finding ourselves just completely um, you know, inundated with emails and phone and and appointments. And so we're reevaluating how we best serve these customers with this high touch experience that we know is so valuable, but also like tie in some of the automated self-help stuff to make sure people can get answers as quickly as possible, right? There are these, there are people who, who love the hands-off approach. I don't want to talk to somebody. I want to click a few buttons and get my return label or exchange. And then there are, there are people that just wouldn't buy from you unless you, they could talk to a, a person. So it's really never like a one answer or, you know, one solution. It's, you've got to have all of that to really like actually thrive in retail now. And so we feel lucky that we do have that, the balance of the stores, the online, the high touch customer service and the, you know, low touch uh, option. Uh, It reminds me immediately of a a story that Jason, who's one of the co-founders of Goriana was telling me on our very first episode this season where they were at like a hibachi grill and he struck up this conversation with the lady who was next to him and Goriana, his wife, who's also the founder and the designer of all the jewelry is right next to him. And they're talking and they're talking. And then he says, oh yeah, like you can meet my wife, Goriana. And then the lady turns and he notices she's like decked out in Goriana jewelry. And she's like, oh my Uh goodness, I love your store. And they come to find out that she is one of their most profitable customers, longest LTV, And yet she is not anywhere in their email list, had never shopped online. She had kind of this ritual where she would come to Montecito to get her hair done and then go to the Goriana store. And she never interacted online. And what they said about it, uh, what Jason said was, you can't force your customers into a behavior they don't want to do. So you have to be okay Uh. letting them pick and choose their journey and give them any option you want. And that's what I'm hearing from you is, Yes, we want this high touch customer service, but also some people don't want that. So we're going to make the best experience mm-hmm. either way and then not force them down a funnel they don't want to go into. Absolutely. That's the key. It's, it's really all about the customer experience and like meeting them where they want to be. And like Jean said, I mean, if you read anything about our brand, it's the, our customer service and it, like the experience is, is amazing. And, you know, we, to sort of a similar story in the beginning, we, we had no money to spend on marketing dollars. Um, so the only thing we could give our customers was just like that very excellent experience and hoping that would be enough to keep them coming back or do word of mouth. And it really did create quite a viral like network effect where customers, you know, would promote us on their, on our behalf. And that's like the ultimate is like when customers are your brand ambassadors, because you've, and when and then you know they may not need a suit for a while, but when they do, they're going to remember. And they and we get customers yeah. that will call us and say, "Can I buy another suit from you?" Like especially, you know, when we when we were traditionally more of a wedding brand, they'd call us and be like, "You know, is it okay if I I just loved the first time?" And we're like, <laughs> "Yes, you can. Yes, yes, yeah, do um, that." So it's, that is like we're. I mean, customer service is worth its weight in gold. And Gina, I think, and I will never. Um, really outsource that. I mean, even to like answering the phones, it's just so important. People are always commenting when, you know, on the phone, like, God, this is so great. Like you have been so helpful. Well, it's the best way to learn what your customers want. And that's the best way to grow your business, right? Is Mm -hmm. listen to what they're asking for. It could be simple little things like, you know, why did you call me and not self-help for this exchange process. And it's like, oh, I get it. Like you have this conversation, you learn something, you share the feedback with the team, make adjustments. And so that's really what we've done this entire time since launch is, oh, you want, you you 
you're not sure you want to order from us because the price is too low. You think it's a quality thing. Okay, we'll send you a suit for free. We launched a free trial. You know, so a lot of our services down to everything we do online, the services, the free swatches, everything was learned by a customer request, you know, and tr just trying to make sure we're accommodating every scenario that comes up. Ugh, I love it. My listeners are just going to know that I'm like, I'm like sweating out of excitement because I'm like, yes, know your customers and then everything else will make its way for you. Every well, they're your yeah, guiding I mean, light. And you want the ultimate, you want the ultimate trust in your customers. I mean, we recently just changed our name to Suit Shop. So for five years, yeah. we were called the Groomsman Suit. Women very early on wanted our product. They started asking us to make women's. Jean spent two years designing this kick-ass women's <laughs> suit and tuxedo. It's been very popular. We're completely sold out of it. So don't try wow. to buy until later this year. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the lady, yeah, lady the yes yesterday actually was like so upset. Unfortunately, we didn't have her size. We're getting more actually in a couple of weeks. So it's fine. But <laughs> I was like, do you know how hard it is to find a white tuxedo? And I was like, yes. I do. I do. One of the only weird. ones that have it. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, with the introduction of the women's collection, you know, our name didn't make sense. And even customers were calling us out on it. Like, why are you called the groomsman suit? Like, not every person that wants to wear a suit is a groomsman. And we were kind of like, you're right. Like, shame on us. Now, <clears throat> it is, like I said, the ultimate risk to break apart a website and your name and change your brand name after five years when you have a tremendous amount of SEO. I mean, we're yeah. experiencing over a hundred thousand visitors to our website every month. It's like a dream that a lot of brands, you know, our age don't get. And, and so, but we, you know, we had to listen to them and they were, they are right. And so we've, you know, launched now a suit shop. It's going, I mean, the response has been amazing and we're probably busier than we ha ever have been, but wow. that was like something that Jean and I really had to like say, okay, are we going to actually destroy the company? Like mm -hmm. sh we should probably tell our investors <laughs> about this idea. And, um, here we go because it's really the right way to be. And it felt so scary. Yeah. It felt so scary leading up to it. So we, we purchased the domain suitshop.com um, probably eight months ago and mm -hmm. um, sat with it and hemmed and hawed and had all these meetings around how this was going to impact the business and sales and will sales tank if we do this. And then we just have to remind ourselves, if you do it in favor of the customers and what the customers have asked for, it always, always works mm -hmm. out. And the, you know, it, it was so scary leading up to that launch day and then we shared it and the number of comments love. from customers and love <laughs> and just the complete respect and understanding for why we were doing it came through and it was such validation yeah. and a, a mm -hmm. constant reminder that you just you've got to make deci decisions for your business based on what's best for, and makes most sense for the customer and then everything else fills itself in you know the sales come yes. the growth comes you, they want new products ask them what they want you know, we ask all the time, what would, what's a color that you would like to see if, and, or they'll, they'll chat us and say, are you making, are you making a burgundy suit? Yes, we are. Oh, I was going to say, you know, I think there, it's a changing dynamic for sure in startup space, because a lot of times um, until probably the past couple of years, growth has really been determined by what shareholders mm -hmm. demand mm -hmm. and what investors demand. And especially if you take institutional money, what VCs are pressing you to do. And, in that situation, a couple of years ago, we probably would have been pressed to be like, open up as many locations as you can. Like if you're not, you know, you get first to market in every major city, like that's, but we haven't gone, we fortunately haven't had to go that route with institutional investors and our, our group of investors have really like continued to let us put the customer first instead of themselves. And yeah. That has been just the game changer for us. It's led to just this really beautiful organic growth that Jean and I are still having suit a lot of fun with um, and feel like we have, well, the customers have kind of control of what we do and then we just follow them along. But, you know, we still <laughs> have control of how we're growing. And yeah, so it's been a really, I think that dynamic is changing in startup space. And the more that brands 
can adopt that and, and also have a group of investors that believe have that same philosophy, it'll work out well. Yeah. You guys have hit on two of like my, I will die on this hill kind of statements and just epitomizes them in a, in a perfect story. One is in this business, often quality over quantity is better. And so you're saying there is this kind of old way of going, let's blast out as many stores as we can, get as many customers in, put as many ads out as you can, but you don't have the quality backed up to actually give them a good experience to bring them back. So while you might have that like real cool little launch of growth, it's going to stall out at some point and then start to dip. And then you're in that like yes. cash burning cycle. The other thing that I exactly. say all the time is that I'm always saying your brand is not who you think you are. Your brand yes. is who your customers say you are. And what you totally. guys have done with this like massive rebrand is just the epitome of that, of saying, okay, they actually don't think we're the groomsmen suit. They think we should be the suit shop. And they're telling yep. us this, and even though it's scary and dangerous, we're going to make that switch for them. And then the numbers and the response shows, I mean, just proves out that this whole time I was right. So everybody should just, I guess, listen to me on everything these days. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, goosebumps. You like, you um, put that beautifully. That's exactly right. And, you, you know, brands, you as, as a company, you have to give yourself time to learn that too. And so to your point, it's like these people with great ideas and a really awesome concept, it's theirs. It's their understanding of what they would want in that situation. So to blast it out to that kind of degree without kind of like pausing and learning, getting feedback and making those changes, you don't give yourself a chance. And it's almost like just built up on a false, you know, thing. And then we started so small, just the two of us shipping, um, answering every single email, phone call, shipping every the single box. Two years. We, we learned <laughs> literally everything that needed to happen to make our lives easier and give the customers what they wanted. And so five years, I mean, five years went by very fast, but to open three stores in five years, is not a super impressive number. Um, but we, we truly like took our time and found the right partnerships, found the right location, listened to what people said. It didn't feel stressful. It felt like exciting. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, mm -hmm. I mean, we're so blessed with the investor situation that we have and the people that truly like just believe in this approach. And it's totally proven to be um, like a sustainable thing. <clears throat> you know, this yeah. is when you're talking about sustainability in a business, yeah. you can't boom um, so fast. Yeah. Everybody always asks like, what's your best recommendation? Like what was, ha what has been like the biggest, like successful driver? And I'm always like the unit when, when you find an idea that the universe is literally pulling you into it faster than you can keep up, like that's a good product market fit. Mm -hmm. That is a yeah. good business idea. And that's like, you know, kind of what, what we've always, we, we've been talking about this whole time is like the universe, our customers have just been pulling us to kind of where we go. Now, actually, we are finally have our legs underneath <laughs> us after five years, although Jean and I still answer the phone, which is a fun fact. <laughs> um, and I think we always will because it's a great way to stay in touch with our customers and chat with them. Um, but we, um, you know, we finally have our legs underneath us. And now instead of forcing ourselves into like new markets, like we have really the pick of the litter. Like we could be in yeah. Texas, we could be in Atlanta, we could be in Seattle, like literally we could be anywhere. And it will be very exciting to move in. Like if we do decide to open more physical showrooms, like the welcome that we'll receive, we won't have to go banging our head against a wall trying to get business mm, or customers. Yeah. So yeah. And that was the, the <laughs> last thing I really heard and I know people can get into this where everything is so stressful and you're always chasing a new sale and you're, you feel like you're never mm. able to enjoy it. And then you start to lose your passion for what you've started. And once you lose your passion, mm -hmm. you kind of lose your ability to sell to people. And so going this approach of continually focusing on the dialogue with the customers, I think keeps that entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, ugh, entrepreneurial we got it kind of <laughs> a big passion <laughs> intact. And that then allows you to be sustainable because you can always go it's into true. customer conversations with like, I yes. still love what I do. Even if we've changed from who we thought we were going to be, 
you yep. can still feel like with you guys have so much passion and energy, it doesn't feel like it's like dwindled yeah. at all. It's probably gotten greater. Well, and there's a lot of like reciprocal, like our like peripheral benefits that come along with kind of, yeah, finding the right fit and being who your customers want you to be. Like we never offer sales. Yeah. We've never had to be. And I think, and you just touched upon it. Like as a founder early on in business, you are chasing every sale and it's very tough to not fall into that discount trap where yeah. maybe I need to put something on, mm-hmm. on discount. Like we just need more revenue this month. And I mean, Gene and I have been to the brink of doing that, <laughs> you know, at different points. And we talk each other off a ledge because wholeheartedly we know like we actually have the best product and service and experience out there and customers know this. Um, and so we can't dilute our value and we haven't had, you know, fortunately we haven't had to um, because of that, but it's a very slippery slope too in mm-hmm. the beginning of like, oh, yeah, you know, getting more market share and then, but we have, fortunately, we haven't, we've been able to kind of, like Jean said, organically grow that way. Yeah, actually the sale, the, the discount games are strong in the suiting industry. It is like, you know, it's the groom gets the free one, rent five, the groom gets a free rental, or if you rent 10 or more, you get a hundred dollars off. And (laughs) it's just so over, It's so gimmicky and so strong that we did have to really, really stay strong in the beginning with customers were asking, do you have any discount codes? What's the discount code? Where If I buy this many, can I have this? Could you do a freebie, this and that? And at first it felt really uncomfortable to say no because we don't say no to our customers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But we basically, as a brand philosophy, we were like, we don't want an inflated price on our products all the time, only to say, okay, guys, it's 50% off now, flash sale, go get it. It's like, from a customer's perspective, if you really think about it, why, if if the company can put it on 50% off, like then why why is the price so high to begin with right and why would i That's ever buy it full price yeah never you never would and and it's because margin is such a huge conversation in retail you know you want these insane margins it's super flashy and then you do the bogo um but we we just decided it was that was going to be one a marketing nightmare and something that was really really difficult for us to manage from like a brand strategy especially when it was just the two of us to put so much time into like what the cycles for the discounts would be and how much they are and just from a philosophy of like, let's not overinflate this price. That's what we're combating. That's what all of these other brands are doing is they're taking these guys, taking this huge, you know, $250 from these guys to borrow a suit for one night. Excuse me? Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> so that's what we were, we were basically saying that that's not how, that's not good customer service. That's not good retail. Now we have this incredible line of suits. We can retail them for a really affordable, great price. We still have healthy margins and we have like super happy customers. So it's total win-win. We get yeah. we get the discount games, discount questions much less frequently now. And as soon as we explain that to our customers of like, hey, it's we just wanted to make sure you guys have the best price all the time. So you don't have to wait. So pull the trigger when you're ready to purchase the suit, not when we're telling you it's a good time to blow out our Mm. inventory, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's at the end of the the day, just like that commitment to the long term and commitment to the customer relationship over time, not just committing to that next quick sale that you can get. Mm -hmm. Guys, Mm -hmm. this has been such a great conversation and like has made all of my, my retention heart just sing. Like, I'm just so, (laughs) I'm so happy that all of the things I've been saying to people actually prove to be successful. So before we wrap up, of course, we ask everybody this question and I'm so excited to hear uh, what you guys say to this. What does resilience mean to you? Um, Yeah, I think for me, resilience is just like complete fluidity. I think, uh, like just being able to, I mean, this just flex, like I have, you know, I used to be, I think a little <laughs> bit of a rigid type a person. Jean, Jean knows me. She, she can <laughs> test. Um, I, you know, I wanted things done a certain way and I've learned that there isn't one way, there isn't one right way to do anything. It's actually like better 
to test and like be incredibly fluid with what your vision is. Um, and so, and when you're that way, when obstacles like a pandemic come along, <laughs> you can't adjust because you haven't been so determined and set on a path. So I think those are two like very synonymous things, fluidity and resilience. And you'll, you know, there's more than one way to get to the top of the mountain. Yeah, absolutely. And just in those moments where you're challenged the most is when magic happens. To me, <laughs> that is resilience. Nobody wanted this pandemic. Nobody wanted to shut their stores. It gave us all such a crazy opportunity to reevaluate everything we were doing. And, you know, to be able to move on a dime like that is and and make really quick thoughtful decisions for your business and what the priorities are and keeping your priorities as your, as your customers and what they need, um, you know, you will rise through the ashes. You know, we, <laughs> we, we had the worst year of the in company history. It was the worst year in terms of not knowing what was going to happen with the business. Yeah. And now Getting through that, powering through, staying positive, we're uh, we are having the best year in company history this year. So there's something to be said for that. Is is just using those really really tough moments um, to figure out what this means for the for your for your future for your growth and powering through, and being resilient. That's that's where the magic happens. Thank you guys so much. This has been that's such a fantastic happens. conversation. Thank, Thank you, you Kristen. Thank it's you. super fun. So fun.